So hello and welcome to a very special episode of The Huddle. And now I have the honor of chairing the board of the National Retail Federation. And I'm here in New York City with just a few thousand of my friends at the biggest conference in all retail, the NRF 2023 Retail's Big Show. And, and I'm excited to introduce you to someone who I greatly admire, Dr. James Cash. And I'm gonna tell you just a bit about him. After growing up in the Jim Crow South, James Cash was the first black student athlete at Texas Christian University, and he was the first black basketball player in the Southwestern Conference. He earned a master's and a PhD from Purdue, and then joined the Harvard Business School faculty. In 1985, he became the first faculty member, the first black Harvard faculty member to receive tenure. And then in 2020, he became the first black person ever at Harvard to have a building named after him. And he's also a co-owner of the Boston Celtics. He served on a number of nonprofit and corporate boards, including Walmarts. And I couldn't be more grateful to have all of you get to share some time with Dr. James Cash. So let's welcome him. So, Dr. Cash, first I want to I want to thank you for leaving the state of Florida in January to come to New York City. John, you're one of the few people that could get me to do that. Uh, <laughs> Well, we could probably get Matt to try to just move the whole meeting next year if that would work. I think that would be a great idea. Sarasota, Florida is a great place to be this time of year. <laughs> it sure is. Uh, well, thank you for coming and spending time with us on this Sunday morning. Um, we, we've got a bit of history together in business, but uh, I want to spend some time today just talking about you and your story. And there's so many people here, including students, who I think can just benefit from knowing what all you've done. And, and you know, in so many ways, you're a trailblazer and you do things that other people haven't done, but I want to start with it, perhaps, you know, where did that come from? Was there someone in your family? Was it something inside you that just caused you to be this, I, I describe you as the eternal optimist, but yeah, where did well, that come from? Uh, like so many of us, I was blessed to have amazing parents. Uh, I had a uh, father uh, who basically very early in life had to stop uh, school to support his family. He was the oldest of the siblings. And during all of my uh, years of being aware of what he was doing, he always had two jobs. One was from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. in the morning as a mechanic for the Texas Pacific Railroad. And then he always had a second job. And uh, because of his uh, inability to pursue education, he always had it as a very high priority for my sister and I. And then my mother was uh, just, again, another amazing human being. Uh, she was fortunate enough to uh, go to college at Tuskegee and work in a pretty well-known historical lab of Booker T. Washington uh, and uh, always set a standard of pursuing education and excellence. Uh, you mentioned growing up in the Jim Crow South. Uh, she was not permitted to take courses on the campus of TCU as an example, uh, but she ended up helping a couple of faculty members find a location to come off the TCU campus to teach her and six of her friends uh, so that they could pursue improving themselves. Oh. And she always grew up with the phrase that she would throw at me all the time, uh, if the elevator's broke, take the stairs. Take the stairs. Don't ever let anything uh, get in your way because hurdles actually help you create and build better solutions and just make sure you continue to move forward. Yeah, I love that. Just keep, keep looking for a way and there's a way. There's so, always a way. Um, from that point, uh, you're a basketball player um, at TCU. We can talk about TCU in a few minutes. A lot of things have been happening there le recently. <sighs> well, uh, some of us don't even have to worry about making it to that game. So <laughs> it's, it's always a privilege that you get that far. But, you know, being from Arkansas, and I went to the University of Arkansas, um, you told me a story a while back about your first trip Right. on the campus, and I'd love to talk about that just a second, because it, it stuck with me and still still does to this day. Yeah, so uh, 
what John is referring to is uh, as the first African American athlete in the Southwest Conference, uh, this was 1965, so it was the middle of the Civil Rights uh, Revolution, and there were a couple of places where I had uh, to have police escorts. Uh, there was a place at the University of Arkansas called Born Hill Arena in those days, and it was one of the places where I had police escorts to get in. During those days, freshmen could not play uh, varsity, and so you had a separate game, and there was a different clientele that showed up for those freshman games. Mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, thing that I loved about that experience was 25 years after I graduated, uh, I was fortunate enough to be chosen to be what's called a Balfour Award winner and invited to the Final Four, which was in Charlotte, North Carolina. The great thing was that that year, the University of Arkansas won the NCAA Basketball Championship, and they won it with a black coach by the name of Nolan Richardson, and they started five black players. So in my lifetime, I had gone from needing a police escort to seeing that university uh, really lead the way in a uh, number first in that sport. The last part of the story that you know well, John, is that I was fortunate enough to be asked to join the board of uh, Walmart in 2006. And by the middle of the last decade, I was fortunate enough to start serving as lead director. We always have our annual meeting in the basketball arena of the University of Arkansas. So in my lifetime, I had gone from police escort to lead director at that time of the world's largest company by revenue, walking into the basketball arena at the University of Arkansas. And I love sharing this story, John, because all of us can sometimes too easily get caught up in the challenges that we have immediately in front of us and the context that we're in. Mm -hmm. But in fact, uh, with the right perspective, with persistence, with faith, basically we always end up in a better place. Mm -hmm. And like my mother said, again, it always prepares you for a better place. And uh, it's just critical that we all, especially in this media intensive world that we live in today, maintain that optimism and perspective. Many, many more people are working in this world to make it a better place than what we have to consume candidly with the sensationalism that is required to get over the threshold of reporting on so many media outlets today. Mm -hmm. But so many more people are working to make this world a better place and that's what we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. you, you know, the story, uh, so many things there that we can all learn from. Um, one of the things that I, I think is a theme that I've always heard from you is, is progress is, in many cases, better than perfection. Don't lose sight of the long term and keep making progress. And just curious, what, what was it like when you, when you went back into that arena for the first time and I, I guess it would have been probably 30 years, 40 years maybe even since you'd been there. What was that like? Yeah. I don't know if many of you know much about the University of Arkansas, but their mascot is a hog. It's a Razorback. It, a hog. They want to call it a Razorback. <laughs> it's a hog. And so the first thing you see walking into the arena uh, is this big red Razorback. And I have to tell you, I fell back into my undergraduate days and I thought, oh, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. Uh, but uh, no, it was really surreal because again, uh, I thought back to Born Hill Arena, which was a different structure. Yeah. And again, it just caused me to appreciate all the work that had to be done for the university to evolve from the environment that was around, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1965 versus what I was experiencing when I first walked back into that uh, uh, arena. And if you haven't ever watched or attended a Walmart annual meeting, you really should. It is just amazing how celebrate the associates yeah. in such a special way. Uh, it is uh, one of the unique experiences in my lifetime. Yeah, it, it really is. And I, I was a student in, in the university when we won that national championship. So you know, just the perspective, that was the only team that I knew. You know, going in was Nolan Richardson was the coach. And exactly. I remember 
a lot of those players and saw them on campus and so that's that's what we knew such a different experience than your first time so change can happen and it can happen quickly if we persist that's right and we put he pressed right so speaking of mascots um we we call it a razorback you call it a hog what is a horned frog <laughs> for those of you who don't know the background for the question i went to texas christian university as john mentioned our mascot is called a horned frog a horned frog is a very unique and special animal that, uh, boy, I hate to sound a little gory, but it shoots blood out of its eyes when it gets angry. And depending on what you're going to say next, John, you may get a little stream of red coming at you here. So, yep. so be careful. Be no, careful. I've got a great way to transition this. I've got a video. Oh. <laughs> it's, oh. a, it's a great video. Recently, Dr. Cash was honored at, at TCU. As I uh, mentioned during that ceremony, the fact that when I was in high school, I couldn't actually take courses on the campus. And now the school was putting up a statue of me was again, something very surreal, but another example of why it's important to have the long-term view uh, about life and the blessings that we have as individuals. Yeah, sure is. Um, you know, one of the, um so many things we could talk about, but one thing I do want to talk about is is your time um, with Walmart on the board and uh, what was it like when you were asked to consider it? I know you'd really focused on technology and other sectors, and so this retailer in the center of the country calls. What was that like? Uh, it was really interesting because uh, when I was first contacted about joining the Walmart board, I was on the board of both Microsoft and uh, General Electric. They were both part of the Fortune 10 at that point. And uh, candidly, because there was so much negative news placement about Walmart, my first reaction, John, was this doesn't sound like the kind of company I would want to be a part of. But I had a mentor and sponsor that always told me, do your own work. Don't be influenced by uh, others who may or may not actually know what they're talking about. And so I had a couple of relatives that worked for Walmart in Fort Worth. Uh, I talked to them and they were to giving me a totally different picture than what was being broadcast about the company at that point. And so I thought, and I, I really felt like they'd be honest with me, so I didn't think they were misleading me, but I said, I better go and talk to some folks that aren't related to me because it could be they just want to have somebody of influence that they know. Uh, and uh, I went and interviewed folks at two different uh, stores in the Fort Worth area. And those associates were so effusive about how Walmart had changed not only their lives, but the lives of their family. And it struck a chord with me because I hope that's been the focus of my lifelong journey, trying to make the world a better place. Uh, and all I can tell you is once I joined the Walmart board, discovered the commitment to associates, all the things that were in place that did very um, effective, did a very effective job of helping the communities that uh, the company operated in. Uh, it's without a doubt uh, the best board experience that I had across my 15 different public company boards. Wow over 35 years, without um, a doubt. We're so grateful for your, your service and time on the board. And I was telling somebody just, just yesterday, I only got to experience a couple years of you on the board. I moved into a role where I could attend board meetings and learn. Just I learned so much from your style and commitment. And, and I love when you switch. I can tell when you switch over to professor mode. <laughs> and, and a lot comes out. But um, you know the things that um, I think we're all proud of is you know, across the industry and, and at Walmart are opportunities. Um, I, I'm actually second generation with the company. Um, my dad started in 77 and, and I, was, I was the first child in our family to not be born in what we were living in, which, which was a single wide trailer. I was the first child in, in that group that was, we had a house. Wow. And from where we are, were to where we are and the way my kids have grown up, it's just That's such great. a difference. It's, it's an opportunity that the company and the industry can make available for you. Now, it's not always easy, 
uh, you know, we all face our own challenges. We all have our own shoes to walk in. It's hard to say what others are like, but you know, one, one aspect of my career, and I'd love to just share and talk with you about how it affected you, is I, I always found myself saying yes to the things that seemed the most obvious answer was to say no to. <laughs> and it was moving around the world with my family and you know putting yourself in tough situations where you could really make a difference but um, you know what advice would you have for people that are young in career middle career and thinking about you know what what decisions are the best to make as you look forward and focus on as you said the long term yeah that's a uh, uh, a great question and uh, I can tell you both as an academic and then when I've worked with executives and companies, I've always tried to encourage them to do what I'm sure you've heard of before. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, find something that you're really passionate about. Because if you're really passionate about something, uh, it won't feel like work. Mm -hmm. And you'll actually outperform all the other people who are doing it because somebody else convinced them to do it, right? And there are so many opportunities for doing that. And certainly have the courage to pursue things that others think are too difficult or uh, they have this sense of uh, failure trying to manage risk and reduce risk. Um, there's nothing in life that we can't learn from. It's really all about our perspective. And for me, uh, because I, uh, I actually uh, and a very strong uh, faith. Uh, there is a particular scripture, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, that is the core of my existence. And it basically says you should celebrate in tribulations. So the counterintuitive sense is when things are going really bad, celebrate. Because again, it's preparing you for something that is more significant in the future. And so if you really have that perspective, there's no challenge that you shouldn't be willing to take on. And when you're in the middle of that challenge and when others are potentially wanting to judge you as having, quote, failed, your perspective should be, this is moving me to a better place. And thank God that I had the opportunity to learn from this. Yeah, it's great. And, you know, the tough times, if if you look at it the right way, they do make you better. They absolutely make you better. In, in business, a lot of times we say you never let a crisis go to waste. And in those tough times, those are the times that you can really separate, you know, your, your team, yourself, your organization. Um, someone gave me advice a long time ago. I had heard, heard a speaker in a setting not too dissimilar from this one who just simply said, figure out what you're good at and go be great at it. Don't spend your time on the things you're not passionate about. Don't spend the time on the things you struggle with. Just figure out what you're good at, be great at it, and everything else works out. I think it's just a fantastic way to look at things. So tomorrow is uh, MOK Day, so big time for the country. And in retail and, and other industries, um, from where we are now, you know, in that, in that perspective, in that framing, what should we be thinking about for the next five to 10 years? Well, first of all, uh, retail touches so many people in so many different ways. It is really one of those things that really moves our world and culture in a very special way. I would just say be culturally sensitive. Uh, we are in a world that really requires inclusivity to be successful, to grow the pie. Mm -hmm. And all of the initiatives that are making the tent bigger or the pie bigger, whatever phrase you'd like to use, are the things we should focus on. And there's no better sector than retail, in my experience, to basically have that kind of positive effect in the world that we all live in. Yeah, I agree. And, and whatever happens in the world happens in the retail environment. And you could decide, if, if you were looking at glass like the glasses half empty, you could decide to find that story. If you want to believe it's half full and spread, you can find that story. So, you know, always looking for what's really going on in the big picture, not just consuming, Absolutely. as you said, the negatives or, or the clickbait or all the things that are in our world today. It's important to keep the perspective. Um, one question that, that Matt Shea has asked me in no less than it feels like a couple dozen forums is, what's the new normal and when is it? And, and I can't answer that question, Matt, because I don't know what it is, but I figured you would know 
<laughs> when it is and what it is. So if, if you have any advice for this entire group of people about how to think about what is the new normal and what should we be thinking about as business leaders and as inspirational leaders for so many millions of people and team, what would you say? So uh, the new normal is in fact the old normal in, in retail because in retail, the communities and people we serve have a very clear calculus. And that calculus is, I want things to be more cost effective, I want them to be easier, meaning I want to have uh, easier access to them, I want better choice, and now that the technology permits me as the consumer to really have the leverage in the relationship uh, I want to make sure that you are personalizing my experience in a very special way. That set of guidelines has been in place in retail for as long as I've been watching, which started back in the 1970s. And the technology causes you to do it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. But in fact, those were the driving uh, factors that uh, I think have led us to where we are today and will continue to lead us. So all of you are experimenting with things like artificial intelligence and machine learning and uh, virtual reality and augmented reality and so forth. And please understand, these are not just snapshots of uh, what's going to happen today. This is a treadmill. And the treadmill will continue to be evaluated. Our performance on the treadmill will continue to be evaluated using that same set of criteria. So there really is not, in my mind, a new normal in terms of how those that are now empowered today to make decisions will decide where they want to allocate their scarce resources. Yeah. It really, really rings true. It's the, the old, what we would describe as the value proposition with this thing at the end called the time tax, which removes value. And as, as I said before you walked out, Loyalty in retail tends to be the absence of something better. And Mark Metric said that a couple years ago, and I, it really rings true. Um, in the industry, it, it, it is important just to note, we say this internally all the time, the only thing that's constant is change. Yeah. And we say it at Walmart all the time, it's true in the industry, and that will always remain true. We will, we will keep moving forward and, and the world will move forward. Um, hopefully you get a sense for the reason why I wanted Dr. Cash to come out today and share some, some of his thoughts with you. This is just an extraordinary human being that's full of wisdom and knowledge, and I always um, am grateful and, and gracious of time I've been able to spend with you. Thanks for doing this on a Sunday morning in, in cold New York City versus where you started from. It means a lot to me, it means a lot to the entire team. And we are so proud of you as, as a Walmart associate, as a former, former board member, and all that you've been through and everything you've accomplished. We're just really proud of you and, and grateful you made the time. Thank, so thank, thank you, John. I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to be here. And again, happy MLK weekend uh, to everyone. And please, just remember, uh, celebrate in the middle of tribulations because with faith uh, you'll persevere and you'll end up in a much better place. Don't let the short-term negative stories, challenges that we face throw you off your track of making this world a better place. Thank you. So many of you serve others in communities that I care about and I just appreciate the opportunity, John, to say thank you to this retail community. You bet. Thank you so much.